All right. Okay, I'm just going to warn you guys. Today's message might take a little effort on your part uh, because there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff today. So hang in there because it's really important stuff, but there's a lot. So just kind of fasten your seatbelts and we'll get through this. But this is like one of the most amazing, powerful passages of Scripture in the New Testament as far as how we change our lives. But there's a lot, okay? So keep that in mind. So last week, we learned about how we're slaves of sin. And so when it comes to turning away from the bad stuff and turning to the good stuff, we discover we're not as free as we think. It's a hard deal. It doesn't happen easy. In fact, it seems almost impossible at times. And like Paul says in Romans 7, Romans 7, the things I want to do, I can't seem to do. And the things I don't want to do, I keep on doing these things. And many of us can relate to that. That's Romans 7. Many of us live in Romans 7. It's so bad that Paul keep, exclaims, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death. And so he's desperate. But he goes on to say, thanks be to Jesus. Okay, so, you know, when we accept and follow Jesus, Jesus can free us from this bondage uh, to live a new life. If we allow him, today we want to learn how to cooperate with Jesus in making us free sons and daughters of God. I just go off for a second. And to do that, we, we go to Romans 8 because this is what we learn in Romans 8. Romans 8 starts out with this amazing passage. Verse 1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Calvary does cover it all. Thank you for that, John. And uh, there is no longer any condemnation. And this is huge. As messed up as I might be, God does not condemn me, but forgives me, accepts me. And this new reality addresses my whole motivation to change. Because before I really truly embraced this forgiveness and idea that I'm not condemned, lots of times my motivation to change comes out of fear, guilt, and shame. And, that, and that's just, and while those are powerful motivations, they are not powerful enough to keep me permanently transformed. It just never works. Our motivation has to be from something more positive and something higher. And in fact, the pain that comes from our fear, shame, and guilt often incites us to do the very things we don't want to do. It's kind of crazy, but it's kind of a vicious cycle. We feel bad, and we stop, or we start, and then we get tired. We, it's that give up, not try hard, give up cycle we talked about last week. And so, you know, I, I struggle with this, but in Christ... The condemnation is taken away. I don't have to fear. I don't have to feel guilt. I don't have to feel shame. That's not part of the equation anymore. That's good news. Okay? But notice this complete, exhaustive, unconditional forgiveness and love and acceptance by God is experienced only by those who are in Christ. Okay? I need to receive the gift. I need to accept it into myself. I need to embrace it. And, uh, but when I do, all of a sudden I have access to this bigger and higher and greater motivation because Christ is in me and I am in Christ. It changes things. And so Paul goes on in Romans uh, verses 1 and 2, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Jesus, Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now Paul informs us that there are two different systems of law or rule of life that we can follow. There's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus or the law of sin and death. Most of the time, even as Christians, we live under the law of sin and death. We just do. We're just used to it. This is the system that we were born into and learned and have been conditioned to, and socialized into, and we're used to it, and we're comfortable with it, and we don't always want to even give it up because some parts of what we like. And that's the old law, and we live there. What is this law of sin and death? It's not just the Old Testament law. The law of sin and death is much more. It includes all the natural, social, psychological laws and principles that our whole world lives by apart from God. Remember 
that when sin entered the world, our connection, the whole world's connection as well as ours with God was broken. So we're, we're talking about a world without God and there's these laws and principles that run our life. They can be studied scientifically. It's, we're predictable. We're predictable sinners. It's kind of something we just know. It's going to happen. And it's kind of like we're on an airplane without a pilot. And no gas. And there are no parachutes. We're going to die. Okay? That's just how that works. And so what happens is in this life, we fall into this rule or way of life where we become self-protective. Look out for number one. Um, we, we fear losing control. We want to gain control. It's kind of like Survivor. How many of you watch Survivor? We do whatever we can. We play the game so we don't get voted off the island. Right? And we try to get as much stuff as we can get while we're on the island. But the truth of the matter is, we're all going to get kicked off the island. We're going to die. It doesn't matter what we do. It's, that's the end game. It's just kind of, that's the law of sin and death. That's the system we live under. And it's not to say there's not some relatively good people on the island. You know, there's a lot of good people, but the goodness is relative. It's not enough to take us to where we need to be. But there is another law or system that we can live under, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We can live in God's grace, okay? And this law frees us from the law of sin and death because it reconnects us to the source of life. It gives us an ability, uh, opportunity to experience God again. It reconnects us. And it gives us something we didn't have under the old law. And with Jesus in our lives, we have a higher motivation that we can choose to act upon. And this can and does free us from the law of sin and death. Notice it says it frees us from the law of sin, not sins. He says we're freed from the law of sin, singular. Jesus says the same thing. In, in uh, John chapter 8, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins, plural, is a slave of Sin, singular. So what is that? Well, old guy by the name of Watchman Nee, how many of you heard of Watchman Nee? He talks about the difference between sins and sins. He talks about there's a difference between the bad things we do here and now, uh, now, now and then and habits here and the sin factory that exists in us. And that's what we're saying from the thing in me that is giving me problems. We need to shut down the sin factory, the source of sin, and the thing I need to be set free from is not the world or the things of the world, but that thing inside me that is attached to the things of the world. That's what needs to go. That's what needs to be dealt with. That's the thing that attaches me to drugs and, and alcohol and sex and gambling and all the bad stuff. But it's also the thing that attaches me to my job, my family, my kids, all the good things. Because you see, Without God, we use those things as a replacement for God, and they can be just as much an idol as all the bad stuff. We can be pretty good people. I just put my family before God, my job before God, whatever it is. And, you know, we like those people. They make the world run. But that's not going to get us free from the law of sin and death. We're still part of the same theme of death. And so, you know, think of your old sinful nature as an alien, parasitic life form that's, you know, eating away at your life from the inside. You know, like a sci-fi movie. It's kind of like that. And you and I have no way to fight this thing, right? But there is a way to kill it. There is a way to kill it. If I want to be free, that part of me, that part of you, has to die. That's what we're going to get into here today. Under the law of sin and death... You know, I try to keep that part of me alive. I like it. I don't want to let go of it. But when I come under the law of the of spirit, of life in Jesus Christ, I'm tired of that part of me and I want it to go. It needs to be put to death. I can't do it, but guess who can? Jesus. If I let him. Look at verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be filled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, 
but according to the Spirit. So I cannot kill this thing inside me that is killing me and keeping me attached to this world, but God can and did by sending Jesus to die in the flesh, and he paid the hostage price and delivered me, freed me. Okay? I can't. God can. But will I let him? Question you have to ask. Paul explains more in verse 4. He says, he did this so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, watch this, who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. See, there's something we need to do to cooperate with this work of God in our lives. He doesn't just wave a magic wand over us and transform us because this transformation that needs to happen in my life involves my will. And if If it involves my will, my will needs to participate. I need to make choices. It needs to be a part of it. It's funny, I can't make the choice or follow through on the choice, but God can help me, but I need to make the choice. I need to take that step and say, God, I want this. And that's the first step we take to do this thing that Paul calls walking in the Spirit. And that's where the transformation happens. Paul goes on in verses 5 and 6. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Okay, so we're getting into the deep end of the pool here. Okay. Because Paul is telling us that we can either set our minds on the things of the flesh or set our minds on the things of the spirit. In the Bible, the word mind refers to much more than just our thinking and intellect and rationality and our beliefs and our convictions. There's much more. In the Greek and in the Bible, the word mind also refers to our emotions and our affections, our feelings. But it also includes our wants, our desires, our wishes, that motivational part of us. The Greek word, the biblical word mind, encompasses all things. It's about our spiritual core. All those things are involved. So that's the thing that needs to be set on either the flesh or the spirit. And so this involves two major changes. Okay, In my mind, my thoughts need to change. And my desire, desires need to change. I can't count when I'm up here. It's like my fingers don't work. And so, Thoughts and desires. Number one, to set my mind on the spirit, I need to replace my old thoughts with new thoughts. Simple as that. Later on in Romans chapter 2, I think Mike gets to preach on this. He says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And the emphasis in this passage is really on our thinking. It's it's big. Okay, let's use the analogy of computer software. See, our minds are like this amazing computer that operates, but it has software. There's hardware and software. And this software has all sorts of viruses and malware corrupting it. And there's this destructive self self-replicating code eating away. In fact, the whole operating system is corrupt. And we all have this to some degree. Even as Christians, I can let this old code run in my brain. I've done it. But in Christ, I have new code. There's new coding. In fact, I have a whole new operating system that I can operate by if I set my mind on it. So at any given time, we have two operating systems going on, and I need to make a choice of which I'm going to run. How am I going to boot up today? What operating system am I going to do? Sometimes I need to reboot during the day. Sometimes I need to reboot all day. You ever have those days you have to keep starting your computer over? That's me sometimes. But I have new code. I, I am not a slave to this old operating system. I can toss Apple and Windows out the window. Wouldn't that be great? Because they are so irritating. But there's a new operating system that's flawless and makes me free. Now, in my brain, there's a whole lot of coding that needs to change. Tons. And so the, 
But let me just point out two lines of code that we especially need to address. Two lines of code that we need to focus on. The first code line is this, God loves me no matter what. Yeah, that's just a big one. You gotta get it, you gotta get it in your heart. We talked about it at our study. There comes a point you need to realize no, how, no matter how messed up you are, how addicted you are, how fouled up you are, God loves you no matter what before you make a single change. That's the good news. And Jesus came to bring us that love. And uh, I, I like John, 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. I love the word lavished in the NIV. It's just great. His love is lavished on us. And uh, you know, talk about a God experience. It's not enough just to believe in God. I must believe that God loves me, values me, thinks highly of me. At very least, I must begin to think that God doesn't see me as a sinful, dirty, ugly, shameful, guilty, worthless, pathetic byproduct of nature. I'm his creation. I'm a son. You're a daughter of God. We are created in his image. In fact, there's a saying that says God doesn't make junk. It's true. But if I think I'm junk, I'm probably going to live like junk, and I'm going to treat others like junk. But I'm not junk. God loves me. Okay? And when I think I'm junk, that's old code. I need to set my mind on the new code. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. But my part is to trust that piece of code over all the other voices that say, nah, worthless. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. There's a new line of code that I need to focus on all the time, and that code comes directly from God. Okay? Code line number two needs to change is this. Jesus is in control, not me. That's a big one for me. Who do I think is in charge anyway? Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. For by him, he's talking about him as Jesus, all things were created both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Got to tell you, folks, I'm not in charge. You're not in charge. Jesus is in charge. That's new code. That's new code, and I have to begin to buy into that. And before Christ, I thought I was in charge. I thought I had a say. I thought I had some control. And that's just ridiculous when I consider that. But, you know, when I'm in my control mode, that's when I get fearful. That's when I get stressful. That's when I get irritated and frustrated and angry and resentful. All the negative stuff comes from my thinking or wanting or trying to hold on to control. I'll talk about this some more. In fact, when I'm in control mode, even as a Christian, I become a little bit hostile to God, disconnected. So Paul goes on in verses 6 and 8. The mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature Cannot please God. That's back in Romans 7. Romans 8, we take a different turn. Because when I trust the line of code that says Jesus is in control, that's when I have peace. And I can live with a confidence that's pretty much supernatural. Even though bad things are happening, I can have a peace that surpasses understanding. Okay? And that's pretty cool. In Isaiah 26, Isaiah says of God, you will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. And I need to put my trust in that reality. There's a lot of code in my head that needs to change, but those two are critical. Okay? But to fix my mind on the Spirit, I also need to replace my old desires with new desires. And this is kind of hard. Back in Romans 6, verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. This is a tough one because even as we grow in Christ, we find there's these desires in our life that battle us, and they demand obedience. We've got to fulfill them. Chocolate, you know. Okay, you know. 
can I really say no to chocolate? There was a time I couldn't say no. And that, you, it goes on. There's a whole list, litany of things we struggle with. And, you know, chocolate's just a safe topic, but, you know, there's a lot of worse stuff, right? And you see, it's not just thoughts about it. There's the desire thing that's not even rational. I can't even explain, but it's there. And I have to do battle with it, and I can't. And so Peter talks about new line of coding. Through these, he's given us his very great and precious promises, the new code. So that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Those evil desires have to go. So way back in the Old Testament, when Israel was delivered out of Egypt and they're wandering around the wilderness, there was this contingent of people among Israel that wanted to go back to Egypt. It took 40 years for those people to die off. All right? And then Israel, the new Israel, was able to walk into the promised land. Where we're the same way. There's a part of us that wants to go back to Egypt. There's a part of us that wants to go back to our old desires. My old desires need to die, but they do not die easily. Our old desires are cunning, baffling, and powerful. That's how they are. And again, I've identified one particular desire in myself that always is at the root of most others. I've already talked about it. Let's talk about thoughts. It's not just the thinking I'm in control. It's my desire to be in control. Because I like being in control. How many of you like control? Come on, be honest. How many of you have control issues? Okay. Yeah, not me. Yeah. You know, and those who say not me, they're the worst, right? Okay, I heard you, Karen. Anyhow, it's something we all struggle with, but it's, it's there. Every sin, there's a little control issue waking up in me. And it's the desire to get control, to be in control, to stay in control. And uh, I know I'm a broken record here. But again, the insane thing is I'm never really in control. The insane thing is I never really can get control. Control is a myth. It's delusional. It never can happen. When my son uh, Joshua was really young, we took him to a music park and we put him in one of these rides where they have the cars that go around the track. And we set him in there and thinking he's going to have a good time. And he went around. The first time he was around, he had this look of panic in his face. And he's like holding the wheel with white knuckles. He thought he was driving. He, of course, he wasn't. He thought he was. Guess what, folks? If you think you're driving... You're not. Yeah, you're just not. But in Christ, I actually am able to learn to drive this thing that God gave me. I'm free in Christ because he, he allows me to do it. The desire for control, more than any other desire, needs to be crucified and needs to be replaced with a desire to experience God and reflect Christ. Man. And I got to tell you, there's this piercing pleasure that comes when we actually experience God and reflect Christ. It's amazing. It's overwhelming. And uh, and we forfeit it. I forfeit it when I seek control. And when I control, I can't trust. But when I trust, I give up control. You can't do both, folks. There's a choice. You set your mind on the things of the flesh or you set your mind on the things of the spirit. And it's right there. It's one or the other. Paul echoes this in Galatians. Look what he says in Galatians. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. I have to choose one or the other. I told you this was getting deep. That's what this is. In practical terms, in practice, what this means is each time I recognize an unhealthy desire taking over my life, I have to stop and crucify it. I have to stop and surrender it to Jesus. Okay? Right then. And then I need to replace that desire with something else. I need to immediately make a God connection. Because usually when a bad desire is taken over, I want something that's not good for me. And I'm always disconnected from God somewhat. I'm looking to fill up something when I let an unhealthy desire take over, even if it's chocolate or even if it's something else. Even if it's in a conversation with my wife 
where my heart's desire is for her to say I'm right. Man, I just wish she could just say, you're right. You know, I want to be right. That's a, it's an idol. And I, you know, you, you got you to gotta crucify that one. You want to be right or you want to have a loving relationship with your spouse or whoever you're, you know. Again, it's all these things that we want about our control, about me and my ego. And, and it's all about me. But I need to surrender it. And then the miracle is, in that moment of surrender, God gives me a reprieve. And that allows me a period, a window of free choice where I can choose to do something else that connects me to God and I can go on my way. That's the miracle. This is what Paul talks about in verses 12 and 13. He says, So brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by, listen to this, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. See, this is, this is not past tense. It's present. This is present and ongoing. On a daily basis, we need to learn how to put to death the deeds of the body. So when the negative thoughts and the negative desires spring up, surrender and turn to God. Always surrender and turn to God. This always involves what I call a surrender prayer for me. I don't know what it might look for you, but I call it a surrender prayer. And so whenever I, I'm having that emotional disturbance, I recognize the desire or the thought. I go, Jesus... This is bigger than me. I surrender it to you. I don't try to fight it on my own anymore. I submit to God and turn to God. And this is what what James says. Listen to what James says. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. That's what I'm talking about. So when I'm facing a temptation, I submit to God. I surrender to God. Then I can resist, resist the devil. Notice it doesn't say resist the devil, then submit to God, because I can't resist the devil without first submitting to God. I surrender it, resist the devil, and then look what it says. Come near to God. Connect with God. Now, this is, this is what's cool. I'll, this is, again, my experience. You might find another way of doing this. But my re- I surrender, and I, my reconnection to God or Jesus might happen when I read the Bible. It might be praying, it might be meditating, it might be calling somebody or hanging out with some Christian friends. It may involve having a personal worship time, cranking up some Christian music. It might involve that. You know, crank up the music and go wild, Renee. You know, where are you at? That's, that's her jam. Yeah, she did, yo, me, yeah, don't tell you. And so I, you get some good music. I, I've listened, yeah. And so, and uh, one of the best ways to connect with God is Go serve somebody. Love somebody in the name of Jesus. Talk about a God connection. And th- I mean, honestly, there's times I've reconnected with God just by cleaning the kitchen. Honestly, I've experienced the joy of Jesus in cleaning the connection in the kitchen. And it's amazing because when God shows up, everything becomes better. And I know it's you know, going that other way wouldn't have given me anything. And I got to tell you, that's what we're after. The new desire is for God, for Jesus in our lives. And this is how Paul ends this section. Verses 14 and 15. He says, all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leaving to fear again. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now that's a God connection. That's a God experience right there. My Abba Father loves me. By the way, for those of you who don't know, the word Abba translates in our language, Daddy. Can you imagine calling the creator of the universe your Daddy? And uh, that experience of having my heavenly Daddy hug me, that's what we live for. But I've got to be honest. Sometimes I still find myself living in Romans 7. Even after that, I sometimes go back. And it's all about me, and it's all about my ego, and my control, or whatever it is I want. Did you know that in Romans 7, if you do a study of it, in Romans 7, did you know that starting at verse 12, the pronoun I is used almost 30 times? The pronoun I, ego is used um, 30 times in Romans 8. It's conspicuously absent. 
Figure that one out. Isn't that amazing? There's a shift. The mind set on the flesh, me, my, is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And when my desire for God and the freedom he offers is greater than my desire to be in control, I will enter into Romans 8. Let me close with a story. In Greek mythology, there's a story of an infamous island known as the Island of the Sirens. And on this island, there was these witches who would sing out all over the waves this irresistible song. And pa- sailors passing by would just be drawn to the island. They couldn't help themselves. And it would draw them in where the witches would kill the sailors. Okay, so it was an island of death. And, you know, what do you do? Well, in the story, Ulysses, the great Greek hero, when he had to sail by that island, he had his men stuff their ears with wax so they couldn't hear it. Okay? And then he had his men tie him to the mast. So he wanted to hear it, but he didn't want And he says, do not release me under any circumstances whatsoever. And as the story goes, he got past the island, but he almost went mad. Went crazy. In another Greek story, Orpheus had to sail by the island. And when Orpheus sailed by the island, he picked up his harp and he played a melody more beautiful than the song of the sirens. Jesus is our Orpheus. I don't have to tie myself to the mast in Romans 7, to keep from sinning. I don't have to stuff things in my ears to stop from hearing all the stuff in the world. There is a song, there's music that's more beautiful than the world has to offer. And that's what gets us into Romans 8. Does that make sense? But the choice is ours. There's still a choice. What music do you want to listen to? What song do you want to hear? What law do you want to live under? Choice is yours. Amen? Let's all be standing for a closing word of prayer. Oh, Father, I thank you so much for giving us this revelation, this passage of scripture, which gives us deep insight into our own psychology and, and give us practical wisdom in each and every life here of how we can put to death that old part of us that's killing us and embrace your spirit that's in each and every one of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. May we learn to connect with your spirit in us and live by that higher law and rule. Free us, Father, because then we can reflect you and lead others into the way of freedom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're... That was good. That was really good. Okay. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, I thought that was... Okay.